we are at our final review lecture reviewing period four from AP Euro 1914 to the present. Um, so far, we've done an incredibly quick recap of period one, the Renaissance, Reformation, Age of Exploration. Period two, the development of absolutism, constitutionalism, enlightenment, French Rev. And then period three, the 1800s of the Industrial Rev, Age of Imperialism and whatnot. Uh, period four is a doozy, looking at World War I, World War II, the rise of dictators in Germany and the Soviet Union and the Cold War. I'll do my best to keep this 20 minutes. Uh, this is a, a very general overview of period four. This is just introducing the themes or reviewing the themes. You'll have to dig in and review the details on your own. Um, first, World War II, 1914 to 1918. Um, when we're talking about World, my bad, world War I, um, remember the main causes uh, main causes is uh, militarism, alliances, imperialism, and nationalism. Uh, militarism is the idea that nations are building up these huge armies, especially because of the industrial rev, which gives them the, the, the capability to create these powerful weapons. Alliances, England and France allying up with Russia against Germany, Italy, and others. Imperialism, which created this, this rivalry between uh, uh, countries. And then nationalism, people are willing to do darn near anything to defend their countries. Um, so Europe was like a powder keg. It was so full of tension, so full of, of conflict that it was just waiting for any spark to light the whole thing and to blow it all up. And the assassination of the Archduke Franz Ferdinand is what finally is that last straw that starts the war. Um, although um, oftentimes a lot of historians like to blame Germany, say that Germany was actually the one who started the war because of what's called the Schleffen Plan, where they attack France through Belgium. Um, world War I itself is an incredibly bloody war. It's the deadliest war, war that the world had ever seen. And, and, and World War I was characterized by trench warfare, fighting in, in those trenches with incredible um, uh, you know, advanced weaponry because of the Industrial Revolution. It was just a truly horrible war, poison gas, uh, was introduced for the first time. Um, and it was really, um, it led to uh, high casualty numbers, but also led to a stalemate where both sides just kind of dug in, neither side really won. And it was a war of attrition. Germany surrendered because they were falling apart and they couldn't fight anymore. When the war finally ends, the Treaty of Versailles is written, which uh, England, France, and the other winners, they decide to punish the heck out of Germany. They have to pay reparations, they have to disarm, they have to lose land, they have to give up their colonies and they have to admit guilt. Um, and so the uh, Treaty of Versailles is humiliating for Germany. It, it, not only does it destroy their country, um, but it humiliates the people. They feel, you know, they were incredibly nationalistic and now they are not only poor, but also they had to admit that a war which they didn't think was their fault was their fault. And so when we get to the interwar years, 1918 to 1939, there's so many things going on. Um, but, but some of the biggest things that we see is um, many people are, are disillusioned after World War I and after the Great Depression. Um, and people begin to retreat and uh, uh, focus just on themselves and try and, and maybe not get involved in international affairs. But it also leads to a rise of totalitarianism, dictators. Um, Adolf Hitler uh, 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 takes power in Nazi Germany by um, appealing to people's nationalism, by promising to make Germany great again, by promising jobs, 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 and delivering on many of his promises. Um, so he, uh, by taking advantage of people's desperation, promising jobs, and then also using violence, intimidating voters, eliminating enemies. Um, Russia, on the other hand, uh, sees a shift in the Soviet Union. Uh, Russia uh, turns into the Soviet Union, um, led by Lenin and Stalin. So Lenin and Stalin uh, create a Marxist totalitarian state. Marxist means um, communist. And so there are some communist 
ideas here. Uh, collectives, which was shared farms, um, and it was kind of a, a worker-led revolt. But that's kind of it. The rest of it is, is really a dictatorship. Um, you've got uh, the terror famine where Stalin kills his enemies. You've got the great purge where Stalin gets rid of any potential uh, uh, military or political threats. You've got the gulag, which was his version of concentration camps where he would send his enemies. And so the interwar years, um, because of, of, of the problems, because of the disillusionment that many people felt, um, many people thought that like, uh, well, many people were, were frustrated with democracy. They didn't think that democracy could fix their problems. And so they were willing to turn to a dictator like Hitler or a dictator like Lenin and Stalin to lead the way. Um, and that leads us to World War II. World War II on, on a simple level is a battle between democracy and fascism, democracy and, and dictatorship. Russia makes things a little bit more complicated. Um, the, the main causes of World War II is Axis aggression and allied appeasement. Um, Axis aggression meaning uh, Germany violates the Treaty of Versailles and they regain power and they invade Poland. Allied appeasement, meaning at first England and France appease Hitler. They let him take Poland in order to avoid a war. Eventually that escalates and war becomes unavoidable. Um, ultimately, the allies ultimately win um, because of advanced technology. They have uh, more bombs, they have more planes. The US eventually has the, the nuclear weapon and kind of an all out commitment uh, by the Soviet Union. But World War II was an even deadlier war than, than World War I was, especially because of the Holocaust where Nazi Germany uh, killed 6 million Jews, 11 million people combined that were considered you know, un, undesirables, homosexuals, gypsies, those that were physically disabled or mentally disabled. Um, and so after World War II is over, um, the US, England, France, and the Soviet Union, you know, they were allies during World War II. Their, their alliance immediately begins to fracture. I'm going to put this in as, as, as the Cold War. Um, so after World War II, the US, England, and France, and the Soviet Union become rivals. And they basically split up the world. They split up um, uh, West uh, Europe and the world. And so the US's approach was to contain the spread of communism. Um, and they do this in a variety of ways. They use the Marshall Plan, to, um, which is economic aid, to uh, rebuild economies so that they'll stay strong and be good allies. The Truman Doctrine, uh, was military aid to fight against communism. They also create NATO, which is an alliance. And so the US's approach and England and France as well is to contain the spread of communism. Soviet Union's approach is the exact opposite, which is to spread communism. And so they uh, rig elections and they intimidate enemies in order to basically control nearly all of Eastern Europe. They create their own alliance called the Warsaw Pact, that keeps those people in check. And so this is going to lead to all sorts of conflicts, uh, leads to, to, to conflicts around the world. Uh, in Korea, in Vietnam, there's an arms race of a buildup of nuclear weapons um, in Germany as well. The US and the Soviet Union, England and the Soviet Union, they never directly go to war, but they're competing for power, competing for supremacy around the world. Um, this competition, um, you know, the U.S. is able to, 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 to stay afloat and keep their economy strong because they've got private businesses. But the Soviet Union cannot keep up. The Soviet Union um, ultimately collapses in 18, sorry, 1989. Um, they've got a poor economy. Um, there's uh, um, no economic growth. And so the Soviet Union keeps on introducing these reforms. Um, there are uh, uh, attempted reforms 
de-Stalinization, which is where Khrushchev gets rid of the gulags and gives people a little bit more, more freedom. Uh, Perestroika and Glasnost, which is where uh, Mikhail Gorbachev in the 1980s um, um, allows for some private businesses and allows for free elections. The problem is if you give a mouse a cookie, if you give people a little bit of freedom, they're gonna want more. Um, and so this ultimately leads to revolutions in 1956, 1968, and then 1989 that ultimately uh, leads to the independence of all of Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union collapses. As the Soviet Union was, was on the top of the world or one of the two or three most powerful countries in the world from their Russian rev through World War II, through the Cold War in 1989. But by, 80, by 89, they've collapsed. And Europe now has this, this new unique challenge of how to rebuild. Um, and so I'm gonna focus on this last bullet point here. Um, after the Cold War, um, there is a, a desire for uh, political and economic unity. The European Union is the best example of this, which was an attempt to have one currency, uh, uh, free trade among all European countries, free, free movement and migration within the European Union, a European parliament that can set rules. Um, and the goal of, of this was to avoid future conflicts. And generally speaking, it's worked. The other big uh, uh, challenge that we see in, in modern Europe or during this time period is decolonization, um, which, which spreads after World War II. Um, when these former colonies, um, colonies in, in Africa and Asia, uh, gain their independence. European nations are exhausted after World War II. They're broke, they're tired of fighting war. And so they're willing to give up their colonies or England is in some cases. Um, and then the African and Asian um, peoples, you know, during World War II, they were oftentimes for forced to fight alongside their white brothers. And they learned about um, the rights that they should have. And so decolonization begins to completely change the world as um, it basically leads to conflicts throughout the world. And the big question is like, will these former colonies um, be free? Will they be communist? Will they ally with the US, with the Soviet Union? And so all those wars we saw in, in Korea, Vietnam was because of decolonization. So that's gonna change the map, not just of Europe, but of the world. And then finally, we end with cultural changes. Um, in terms of philosophy and art, there is a focus on kind of the irrational and the um, subjective, which means there is no one truth. And so modern art is all about um, um, abstract expressionism and being able to express yourself in a more abstract way. Dadaism was that one where you had a urinal as a work of art. Surrealism is like trying to paint your dreams. Abstract expressionism, Jackson Pollock's the best example of that, those splatters on, on a canvas representing his feelings. So that's one cultural change. And then the other big cultural change is that women gain um, more rights and opportunities during the 19th century. Um, they are uh, forced to work, not forced, they work during World War I and World War II in factories. And that kind of proves that they are, uh, are just as valuable as men. And so they gain the vote after World War I and, and World War II in some countries. Um, there's another modern feminist push for true equal rights. Um, but the World Wars is really what allows women to prove that they deserve these rights and to eventually gain the vote. And so as we wrap up here again, an incredibly quick overview of the, the 20th century, what do we see here? Well, we see a, a mega world war, um, a massive world war. Some people like to say that World War I, inner war years, World War II is one big war, 1914 to 1945. And what this is really about is it's about democracy, England, France versus totalitarianism. It's really what the world war is about ultimately democracy wins. But after uh, uh, this massive world war, it's replaced by the Cold War. 
which is an indirect conflict, or sorry, an indirect competition for power, uh, which again, democracy versus totalitarianism, democracy versus communism. And then the post-Cold War world, we're seeing um, a shift, or not a shift, but we're seeing, yeah, a shift towards more democracy and more unity across Europe. And so I really like to think of the 20th century as, you know, the wars are a culmination of our entire course. Our entire course is all about different forms of government and competitions for power. And when you take, you know, those nationalistic rivalries and then you add industrialized warfare and weaponry, what do you get? You get incredibly devastating world wars and cold wars. And so World War I, World War II, the Cold War is really the culmination of these, these political uh, uh, and economic and technological movements we've seen the entire course. And by the end of it, by 1945 after World War II, by 1989 after the Cold War, European countries and leaders and people begin to realize like, all this has led to is bloodshed and war and conflict and competition. And it actually hasn't made my life any better. And so there's, there's really this, this miraculous movement after World War II and after the Cold War to have democracies, to focus on unity and cooperation rather than conflict. And so I always love that, that AP Euro ends with the European Union. It, it, it ends towards this push to unity because finally the Europeans learn their lesson and they begin to replace competition, conflict, war, nationalism with perhaps something more long lasting. And so with that note, pause here to get your notes caught up if you need to and pause here as well. <laughs>